friends, brothers, sisters, there are those in Christian evangelicalism, especially here in American evangelicalism, that believe in order to make the Bible relevant, you preach, not according to a calendar, not according to what's next, but according to world events, current events. In order to make the Bible relevant, the only way to preach is to look at the newspaper headlines and preach to make it relevant before your congregation. Sadly, this type of preaching often diminishes the power of the Word of God and its relevance. It undercuts that Scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof and instruction. All of Scripture. Meaning that those places that we might not deem relevant by world events may never get preached. And so, as most of you probably know, I plan out our sermons months in advance. Matthew has been on the docket for at least uh, three months or more. So as we come to Matthew 8, 23 through 27 this morning, it is not in light of current events, and yet the Lord's sovereignty and kindness is very much as relevant as it is and kind. Because our God is that good. And his word is that applicable and relevant for our instruction and for our benefit. Brothers and sisters, this is the beauty of expositional preaching that we labor to do here week in and week out. Taking what's next in the Bible, opening it up and seeing what does it actually say and then how does it apply to us where we're at here in the year 2024. And that's what we aim to do this morning. So, in light of that, this is very relevant and applicable in the midst of recent events. As you've heard this morning, if you were already, or if you were unaware, Hurricane demolished parts of Florida and Georgia and the Carolinas and the Love East Tennessee to me. There are towns that were there on Thursday that are almost essentially wiped out. People trapped in the mountains that some have compared to Katrina. But even more desperate because Katrina, everyone was confined to an area. Appalachia is not like that. It's scattered, remote, wilderness. You can't even land a helicopter in some of these areas. But it's a good thing as we come to Matthew 8, 23 through 27, our sermon text for this morning, we see that Jesus is the creator. He's the one sovereign. That even the winds and the sea obey him. And that should be comforting for us. Because whether we're unaffected by this, I know at least two in our midst have family that were affected or know of that area and friends that were affected. Soon enough, we may find ourselves in something similar and need to know this ahead of time so that we may take part. So turn with me to Matthew 8, 23 through 27 in your Bibles. If you do not have a Bible of your own, please grab that red pew Bible and turn with me to page 967 this morning. 967 for Matthew 8, 23 through 27. To help us get our bearings, and if you have not been with us, we've been studying the gospel according to Matthew for some time off and on. We started last December uh, and went through chapter 7, took a little break, and now we're back in 8, 9, and 10 this fall. And as we've done so, Matthew is writing this gospel account, not his own gospel story, but telling of the same gospel that Mark and Luke and John tell, just in his own way of communicating who this Jesus really is. We saw in the very beginning of the gospel according to Matthew that Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is the one to come to fulfill all the promises to that promise to David of a king forever and of Abraham to be a blessing to the nations. This is who this Jesus is. This is also the Jesus who is God's own son who he calls out of Egypt. For Jesus himself went into Egypt to be in exile and was called back. This is the Jesus who we are told has come to save his people from their sins there in Matthew 1.21. 
We also see that this is the Jesus who is authoritative. He has authority in his teaching. He has greater authority than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, the teachers of Israel. Jesus teaches with a greater authority than them. And then we saw he has greater authority over that of illness. Casting out leprosy, healing that of a Gentile, a centurion Gentile, a foreigner, a non-Jew. He heals him from afar with but a word. And he casts out demons. This Jesus is one with great authority. The way Matthew's gospel is structured, we have an introduction in chapters 1 through 4, a discourse, a teaching passage of Matthew 5 through 7, and then now here in 8 and 9, we're back in another narrative discourse telling us. Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus taught with authority. Matthew 8 and 9 are showing just what authority he has. And that's where we're at this morning, here in Matthew 8, 23 through 27. So hear the word of the Lord from Matthew 8, 23 through 27. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even wins and see, obey? This is the word of the Lord. Now here's what I think the main idea of Matthew 8, 23 through 27 is. And we're going the main idea of this sermon. When our fears overwhelm our confidence that Christ is with us, we have little faith. Great faith, though, is had when we remember that Christ is with us to the end of the age, even in the midst of the raging storm. Let me repeat that. When our fears overwhelm our confidence that Christ is with us, we have little faith. Great faith, though, is had when we remember that Christ is with us to the end of the age, even in the midst of the raging storm. We're going to unfold this in two parts that pretty much split the, this section in half of the two scenes. First, the great storm. That's point number one. The great storm covering verses 23 through the first, really, sentence of verse 26. And point number two, the great calm covering the end of 26 and 27. The great storm and the great calm. That's our two points this morning as we seek to unfold this main idea here that's on the screen. Point number one, the great storm. Initial orders were given to the disciples to prepare, and we're going to cross the sea. We're going to cross the sea to get away from the crowds. This took place there back in Matthew 8, verses, verse 18. But something happened, a, a delay happened. Jesus and his disciples were unable to get away quick enough because the crowds that followed, two from the crowds are said to desire to follow him. And as they seek to follow him, he gives them the, the cost. Here's what it will cost you to follow me. To one who wanted to follow too quickly, he said, you've not counted the cost. I have no place to lay my head. Foxes have their dens, the birds of the air have their nests, but I, the Son of Man, has no place to lay my head. He turned away and did not follow because he thought the cost too high. One was not quick enough in his falling. He claimed, I want to follow you, but let me first bury my father. His father, who was not even dead at that time, because if he was, he would have been burying him in that moment instead of gallivanting to find this Jesus. That his culture mandated a son, a good son, would have been present there with his father in death. So if his father was on his deathbed or dead, he would have not had time to be out and about searching for this Jesus. This one was not quick enough to follow Jesus. I retell this from last week because of what we see here in verse 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. The disciples heard these calls. 
Four of them have already counted this cost in leaving their boats and their fishing business and their father to go after this Jesus. Brothers and sisters, first and foremost, the story of the storm is about discipleship. It's about what true discipleship is and what it looks like. Disciples follow their teacher having counted the cost. They follow their Lord having counted the cost. Wherever he may go, whatever may lie ahead. Brothers and sisters, let that be primary. This is about biblical discipleship, counting the cost and following Jesus. But it's not just following him, it's trusting him over and over and over again. Verse 24. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. Now, it is not uncommon in the seas here in this region of what is presumed to be the Sea of Galilee for these storms to suddenly pop up. These storms were known to pop up out of nowhere and create hurling winds. This is no ordinary story. This is a great storm. A storm that brings with it shaking and raging. One translation says it was a furious storm. It is so great the waters are swamping their boat, threatening to drown them. And the very fact that these fishermen, who at least four of these in the boat with Jesus would have been fishermen, so they would have been familiar with the waters, they would have been familiar with the storms, they themselves are cowering and trembling in fear. The most experienced are trembling with fear. And they turn to the one who's not a fisherman. They turn to him, the son of the carpenter. Let that sit in the back of our minds as we press forward here. This great storm here, swamping, and what is Jesus doing? He lay asleep in the boat. Now, first and foremost, this should not communicate to us that the storm happened because Jesus was asleep. That somehow when tragedies happen, somehow God's asleep. That's not what this communicates, brothers and sisters. Uh, that would be a foolish and a careless reading of this. But what it shows us here is Jesus, here in the midst of this storm, is showing us, one, he relates to us in his full humanity. He's been busy doing ministry. He's been busy preaching the gospel. He's been busy preaching the kingdom of the heaven in that gospel. Busy healing. He's been busy and up all night praying. He's been busy in all of these things. He gets into the boat and lays here so tired that he sleeps through the midst of the storm. It shows us that he is one who relates to us in the fullness of his humanity, that he gets to the point of tiredness. Now there are some that want to argue that somehow Jesus here was not really asleep, but pretending to be asleep, but that is foolish. And I have those in church history that would affirm and agree with that. That thought is foolish that Jesus somehow is pretending to be asleep. He is actually asleep, showing us his humanity, his relating to us. But it is also showing us here his trust. His trust in the sovereign Father. It's showing us that Jesus, knowing what lays ahead of him, Jesus, keep in mind, he knows his end. As we said over and over again, the end for Jesus is the cross. It's the cross there on Calvary where he will be pierced for our transgression, where he will die so that we may live. This is the end for this Jesus. He knows it. Therefore, he has confidence as he presses on that nothing will stop him from that because it is not just his plan, it is the Father's plan. And the Father will accomplish all of his purposes. Jesus has trust in the Father in the midst of the storm as it arises, as it moves, as it swamps over them. So Jesus is trusting in the Father. He needs not be concerned with the raging and the shaking of this storm, the swamping of the boat. He trusted in his Father. He trusts and knows who he is, but he exposes their weakness. 
Look with me there at verse 25. While he lay asleep, and they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Now, the disciples here, again, we talked about previously in Matthew's gospel, this idea of Lord. They recognize Jesus as Lord, as one who is leading them, as one who is authoritative over them. They trust in him so much and call him Lord, save us, recognizing that he can save them. But fear overwhelms them when they say we are perishing. They fail to remember the one who holds it all together. They remember who's in, fail to remember who is in the boat with them. This Jesus, this Son of God, who has been sent to save his people from their sins, who he knows their End. His end. <laughs> Friends, the disciples are told here, oh, you of little faith, because fear overwhelms them. It's not just fear of the unknown of what's ahead. They fail to trust God in this fear. This is what we see in the midst of this. They feared the storm. They counted the cost, yet they feared the storm. Here's what one commentator says. Oops, I don't have this one in here, sorry. Irrational fear resists comfort. It forgets the power and goodness of God. It extinguishes faith. Godly fear recognizes the threat at hand, but it is tempered by confidence in God. When dangers loom, we should remember that God masters storms. Irrational fear resists comfort. It forgets the power and goodness of God. That's what the disciples are struggling with. This is why they're being told they have little faith. They've forgotten the power and the goodness of God. Their faith was not strong enough in Jesus to trust in his authority over them. Friends, this is where the sovereignty of God comes into play in our daily Christian lives. In the midst of trials and afflictions and sufferings, do we trust the goodness of God in the midst of it? Do we trust that he is actually over all things and working them truly out for our good as Christians and for his ultimate glory? Because if we don't, as storms, as trials, and as tribulations arise, we're going to cower in fear and fail to be able to remember the goodness of God. We need to see this now. The Lord allows such afflictions, such trials, such sufferings to press against us in a matter to expose where our faith really is, just as Jesus allowed the faith of these disciples to be tested, to be taken through the fire. Do you really trust me? Do you really trust I am who I say I am? Do you really trust that I am capable of saving you? and sisters, what do the trials of our own lives tell us about our faith? As things get hard, do we truly trust that God is over, that he is good, or do we doubt him? That's why trials and sufferings and afflictions come upon us, even as Christians. It's not a, a means of saying, here, follow me, and things are going to get better and easier. Christian, we live not for this world and not for the current blessings. We live for the world to come and the promise of heaven where all is wiped away and overturned. But in the meantime, while we wait, these afflictions will continue to come. But do we have strong enough faith to endure? Do we have strong enough faith not just to say, I trust Jesus verbally, and yet the moment things get hard, we cower in fear. Let's fear the Lord and trust him. When our faith seems weak, let our faith be strengthened by remembering who our God is, particularly who our Savior is. Let me close point number one of this quote by J.C. Rudd. We never perhaps know the weakness of our faith until we are placed in the furnace of trial and anxiety. Blessed and happy is that person who finds by experience that his faith can stand the fire. That he can say with Job, Though he slay me, yet 
I will trust in him. Christian, let us take heart that our God takes us through this because he is good and we can trust him. Point number two, the great calm. Friends, we are to take heart even as we struggle in the midst of our weak faith because Jesus doesn't just rebuke the disciples and us and saying, you owe you a little faith. Notice what he does here at the end of verse 26. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Jesus rebukes the winds and the sea in their shaking, in their ferociousness. He brings a great calm. Friends, one, hear this quote from Spurgeon. As it was a great tempest, now he gives a great calm. There was nothing little in the whole business except the disciples' faith. There was nothing little in this. It goes from great raging to great calm at the word of Jesus. Not just it calms down. Now, if we were to go and look at the coverage from these storms, you're still going to notice the rivers are raging and rolling. You're going to notice that there's still much still ongoing on, even as the storm has passed hours ago, days ago. There's still some raging left. Not with this storm. Jesus brings an instant calm to the once tumbling sea that was threatening the storm. He brings this stillness over it. So much so that the, the disciples, the men, marvel, verse 27. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? Even winds and sea obey him. Now notice what Matthew does here strategically. He goes from disciples in verse 23 to men here in verse 27. Now there's some debate about this as do we bring in Mark's gospel here? And is the men those of the other boats that Mark's gospel makes mention of? Maybe. Doubtful, but maybe. But more likely what's happening here is there's a strategic play on the men in the boat. To what sort of man is this before us in this Jesus? What kind of men these disciples are in the little faith? Here stands one before them. Wait. This Jesus, who truly is he, that he has such authority to calm the sea and the land, something that is only attributed to God. Remember I told you earlier in the service, Psalm 107 would make more sense later? That later is right now. Psalm 107, as it gives these attributes there in verses 23 through 30, as it, it tells there in verse 25 particularly, this God who raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. And then four verses later in verse 29, we read that the Lord made the storm be still, and the waves of the sin were uh, uh, the sea were hushed. God did this. He brought the storm, he brought the waves upon them, and then he quickly calmed them. Jesus now has done this same thing, so the thought of what sort of man is this is saying, wait, this is only attributed to God himself. The disciples are maybe, maybe slowly beginning some light bulbs click here as they realize Jesus is not just fully man, but he is one who is fully God. He is the second person of the triune God among them. He is the one who is fully God himself with all of his authority, even that over creation itself. Here's what's said of Jesus later in the talk by the Apostle Paul. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Friends, it is this Jesus who's in the boat with them. It is this Jesus who has the ability and the authority to calm the sea and the wind before them. 
This Jesus is God. He is the one who has come to take away the sin of the world. This is the hope we have. Friends, in the midst of the storms, it's important for us to remember who Jesus rightly is. He's not just any ordinary man. He's not just the man who died on the cross. He is the one who has all authority. All authority. And this is one of the most neglected parts of our Christian discipleship so often. This one who has all authority is promised to be with us until the end. Now, hopefully you're familiar or becoming more familiar with this from Matthew 8, uh, 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. But that's not the end of the commission, is it? And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The one who commissions us to follow him, the one who instructs us what it means to be a disciple, he's not only given all authority, he's with us. It is he who's with these disciples in the midst of this raging and ferocious storm. He is with them in their midst. And that should be their confidence. That should be their trust. Friends, he has promised to be the same for us and his disciples. We who have promised to follow him, he will not leave us or forsake us. As trials and suffering and affliction and sickness and death and storms come, this same Jesus who was with his disciples is with us. And he will be there to strengthen us and sustain us because all authority is his. This is the Jesus we follow. This is the Jesus we have with us, brothers and sisters. This should give us great confidence. Because we should remember, as one commentator puts it, we must remember that God masters the storms. Let us remember that God that masters storms here. This helps us to rest in Jesus in whatever affliction and sorrow come. Brothers and sisters, let us take in this. Let us not despise the trials and sufferings that come and fall upon us because we recognize that they are a means to expose the littleness of our faith and strengthen it. It is there like a refining fire, these trials and these sufferings, to refine our faith and to strengthen it on the other side so that we stand firm and endure. But as we prepare to close, I want to make sure any here who have not yet trusted in this Jesus understand the implication for them. Friend, maybe you're here this morning and you have not trusted in this Jesus. Maybe for you the means is that you need to understand that your present sufferings, your present trials is a means to show that you don't have it all together and can't actually bring yourself out of your suffering, of your own strength. That there's no hope, really, at the end of it. Things might get better for a while, and then what's going to happen again? There's no hope of future. Not apart from the gospel. So, friend, for you, one of the things you need to see that Jesus is standing, inviting you in the midst of your present afflictions and sufferings and, and trials, to say, I need hope. I need hope. And it's offered in this Jesus. He stands ready to say, to promise that life eternal. He stands there to reveal to you the goodness of God in all of it. That yes, this world is broken. Don't put your hope in it. But here's the glory of the creator who's at work undoing it all and making it new again. Hope in this God. Friend, make today the day of salvation. Believe in this Jesus. Place your faith that through his death on the cross, that your sins can be forgiven. And that through this resurrection, you too can have the hope of life everlasting and a resurrection of your own. Repent and believe. Friends, Jesus is the Almighty. We do not know what lay ahead of us. 
Let trials and sufferings, hardships, and become our way as we take up our crosses daily and follow him. But we who have trusted in Jesus, we have this promise that Jesus will be with us until the end of the age. And that all authority has been given to him. That he's the one, though he may not end our present trials and sufferings the way we would like him to, he will not leave us or forsake us. And he will strengthen us and carry us through. Even if the end of that suffering is death itself, he will carry us through. For we will be with our Father for all eternity. Where no more sickness, no more sorrow will come. Friends, this is what we have in this Jesus. Therefore, let us continue to learn to trust this Jesus, our Savior, our friend. Trusting him, knowing that he is with us and will be with us to the end. Oh, the grace to trust him. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word this morning. That you are not one who does not allow us to go through storms. In fact, you bring them upon us. But it is for our good as disciples. It is so that we may learn to trust you, put our trust in you versus any knowledge, any preparation we may think we're trusting in or whatever we are trusting in more, what you are teaching us to trust in you. To trust in your love, Son, Jesus. How do you pray that you will help us do this? Help our hearts increase in this faith so that we may stand firm until the very end. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name.